This is the Bottom Line Sports Show with Gerald Brown and Rick Mahorn. Back here on the Bottom Line Sports Show, we're reacting to last night's good basketball, exciting first-round basketball. And really, again, the the must-see, and I think all the series are must-see. So we got four exciting games coming up tonight, but let's move and stick with the Knicks and Atlanta Hawks series. It's been outstanding, and this gentleman does an outstanding job on Knicks Fan TV. You can check that, catch that on YouTube, as well as you see him on the Max Kellerman Show. CP, the franchise, is joining us, a.k.a. Casey Powell, a.k.a. CP, the franchise. CP, the franchise. What's going on, man? Gerald and Rick, good morning from Atlanta. Uh, it was a rough night last night. Tough loss, 105-94. to 94. Uh, I was in the building with a number of Knicks fans, but uh, they didn't give us much to cheer about last night, so hopefully Sunday's a better showing. Now, CP, let me ask you this, man, and, and, and here's the thing. And, I, I, you know, Rick and I spoke about this. You know, most people can look at, look at what uh, Julius Randle has done thus far. He's really struggled yeah. in terms of finding his offense. Some of this stuff, you know, say when you sit back and say, oh, well, they're double teaming him. They're triple teaming him. He's not really hitting shots, but it seems apparent that the Knicks haven't made too many adjustments to really get him going and figuring out other ways to be able to allow him to score as well as these other players stepping up and hitting big shots. What are you seeing from your vantage point thus far in this series? Yeah, a couple things. I think a lot of the tough shots that he's made in the regular season, they're just not falling for him in the postseason. You know, I thought the Hawks are doing a pretty good job defensively uh, shadowing him with Clint Capella. I think um, DeAndre Hunter has been a big difference maker for the Hawks in the way that they've been defending Randall. He only played in the first game of the three-game regular season set against the Knicks in which Julius Randall averaged 37 points per game. Uh, additionally, I don't think he's getting enough easy looks. A lot of his looks are coming out of isolation. I'd like to see them running some more pick and roll sets between he and Derrick Rose. Uh, maybe even have him operating more out of the post and maybe that he, he will generate a bit more better looks from the double teams, you know, and reading the double teams. A lot of the issues with Julius is that he, he's not reading the double teams and making uh, quicker decisions. And I think that has a cascading effect on the rest of the lineup because during the regular season, he's had excellent chemistry with Reggie Bullock, with R.J. Barrett, in getting them great looks operating out of the double team. And he's just not able to get that going. You know, he's not making the quick enough decisions out of the double to really get those guys going. And, and I think it's having a ripple effect on this lineup. Well, CP, you know, you're down there in the ATL looking at uh, the Knicks and, and, and seeing, like you just said about Julius Randle, isn't this just more of a, his first time being in the playoffs in this kind of uh, heated uh, type of uh, you know environment? Because you, you don't learn, you know, from double teams just, you know, from here or there. It's, it's a process as being the star player and everybody's throwing a kitchen sink at you. Do you think that experience has to, uh, has to really try to rapidly increase? Yeah, I do. And, and shout out to Rick, my, my fellow Hamptonian, uh, a legend at Hampton University, my alma mater. So Rick, it's definitely great to talk to you. But but I see. Wait, I'm sorry. You, you know, I'm sitting yeah. here going like I, I, I was like, he went to Hampton. You didn't know nothing. Stop yes, I that did. old. <laughs> the, the real H.U. The real the real Hampton, baby. That's what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. That's it. That's it. But you're right, Rick. I think the inexperience is certainly getting to him. You know, I was at games one and two at MSG, and it just felt like the moment with the, the lights were too bright for him. And I, I think he he has to learn from, from these experiences because it's a pressure cooker situation. There's no doubt about it. I think there's still questions as to whether he can be that 1A guy, that dog that can really carry this team. Uh, I don't think he can be. And I think we've gotten to the point where, not that he's been exposed, but it's it's... At the point where you realize that this team needs more talent uh, around Julius Randle that can, you know, where he can be more of a supporting player than than the lead dog. But there's no doubt that, you know, this is certainly a learning experience for him. I also don't like the fact that, you know, he seems to be um, easily taken out of his game. You know, things got chippy between he and John Collins early in the game, and it seems like he didn't really recover from that either. So uh, a lot of lessons to be learned for Julius Randle in this series. But, you know, it, it's still a 2-1 series, and, and we'll see what happens on Sunday if they can tie it back and, and bring it back to New York for Game 5. 
CP, the franchise, Knicks Fan TV. Uh, if you if you ever want to watch a digital show, a post game show, and, and and really again talking about the Knicks, do yourself a favor and check out check out Knicks Fan TV. It is outstanding production quality, magnificent, really great Knicks t- uh, Knicks uh, talk, Knicks Fan TV. It's outstanding. But CP, let's look at Derrick Rose now. Derrick Rose, a lot of people really have forgotten about what he was able to what he has been able to do we all know about the injuries his recovering he was brought in just to be sort of that other piece but this guy has been what we thought Julius Randle would be in this series and last night he didn't disappoint 13 of 21 30 points to go along with six rebounds and five assists how impressive has impressive has it been for Derrick Rose uh and his performance thus far in these uh, three games well, Gerald, there's no doubt that the Knicks would not be in the fourth seed in the East without Derrick Rose. That midseason trade uh, for for Dennis Smith Jr. and a second round pick has been outstanding for the Knicks. He's been everything that they've needed. And uh, Tom Thibodeau closed with Derrick Rose in the starting lineup in the second half of Game Two, and he took us home. Game Three, he was the best player on both en- on both teams. And so Derrick Rose has just been absolutely outstanding. You know, being the veteran, being the former MVP, um, just being battle tested. You know. He really carried this Knicks team. It's just unfortunate that the rest of the guys just have not followed suit. And, and again, we look at Julius Randle going 13 of 54 in this series, 24%. Uh, it's the worst shooting percentage through the first three games of a playoff series. And that's just not going to get it done. 7 of 34 on two-point shots. Uh, you know, Derrick Rose has done a lot for us, but he can't do it by himself. And Julius Randle really has to be that engine for us. Does the does the crowd? I mean, you're down in Atlanta, and I remember mm, coaching yeah, in yeah. Atlanta, and I remember we played the Knicks or we played the Lakers, and it felt like you're playing in their gym, the way the fans that came out. But last night, you have to give it to Atlanta. The Atlanta Hawk fans seemed like they came out and they're really supporting this team. But how how what adjustments do the Knicks need to make uh, in this game? For I mean, you you made an adjustment by starting Derrick Rose. What other, you know, what other adjustment can you make if you're the Knicks? Yeah. Well, I think it starts on the defensive end, Rick. I, I really think it starts on the defensive end. I mean, this was a one-point game in the second quarter with four minutes to go, and Atlanta goes on a 20-5 to run to close the quarter, and they really never look back. And that starts and ends with Trey Young because he's been electric out of the pick and roll. Uh, a three-level score, you know, do you try to trap him on the pick and roll? Well, he becomes a facilitator. He had 14 assists last night, the same amount of assists as the Knicks had. And I spoke to um, to Jerry Farrar, the actor from Entourage and Power, yesterday, and I said, you know, Atlanta's offense, you have to expect that they're going to be able to open things up. It's a matter of, you know, can the Knicks counter that uh, offensively themselves? And we just didn't have that firepower. So um, they have to figure out how they're going to stop that Trey Young pick and roll. You know, because it, it, it's he and Capella have that uh, chemistry. You know, the alley oop to Capella has been unstoppable. Uh, Trey Young's getting the outlets to his three point shooters, whether it's Gallinari, whether it's Herder, whether it's Collins as well. So they have to make adjustments on the defensive end of how they want to get the ball out of his hands and maybe make these other guys beat them. On the flip side for the Knicks, you know, there is a ripple effect when you do start Derrick Rose and that you lose offensive firepower and another f- capable playmaker on your second unit so that's going to put more pressure on Alec Burks on Emmanuel quickly to deliver more offense for that second unit I'd like to see maybe RJ Barrett get some run with that unit to be another capable playmaker and get some more opportunities uh, to shoot the ball with that unit uh, rather than just playing with Julius Randle and Derrick Rose so those are some of the adjustments that that I would make if I was Tom Thibodeau. CP the franchise here uh, of the Knicks fan TV here on the bottom line sports show Gerald Brown Rick Bohorn talking about the Knicks and the Hawks series right now, the Hawks will lead that series 2-1. And you mentioned about Derrick Rose, and we're going to talk to B.J. Armstrong, Derrick Rose's agent at 12 o'clock. But you look at Rose, who was, like you mentioned, in Game one and Game one and Game 2, really came off the bench. He started last night. He played a lot of minutes. And when you look at the minutes of these guys, and that's been a tib sort of M.O. with his Chicago Bulls team, guys playing a lot of minutes and stuff. Uh, do you look in a situation where perhaps that could come back and haunt the Knicks going forward if these guys who are logging a lot of minutes, really their production starts to slip? 
yeah, you can certainly question that in, in terms of Julius Randle's lack of production. You know, Derrick Rose's minutes restrictions, he's, he's been on a minutes restriction since he was in Detroit. Now he's upwards of, of over 35 minutes per game. So that's certainly something that uh, needs to be looked at. I think overall, it, what it points to is just a lack of depth and a lack of, uh, you know, reliable options on Tom Thibodeau's bench. You know, the point guard situation has been uh, one that the Knicks have needed to improve on uh, going into this offseason as well. You know, Derrick Rose has done all that he can do, but uh, the reason that he was inserted into the starting lineup is because Alfred Payton has been ineffective. And even though Alec Burks can come in as an emergency point guard, um, he's not the ideal playmaker that, that you really want running a second unit. And so it puts even more strain on Derrick Rose because you really have to rely on him to generate a lot of offense for you. So um, the minutes could impact the Knicks as they get further and further into this series and, and it certainly bears watching. Yeah. You know, you did bring up a, a, a player that really needs to step up, and that's R.J. Barrett. And you, you yeah. said yeah. him coming off the bench. But, but you know, Tibbs made two, you know, two changes in that starting lineup and putting Taj Gibson in, in that lineup and putting New Orleans Noel on the bench. But it's like, okay, uh, what was the reasoning, for, if in your opinion, uh, what Tibbs did yeah. with yeah. that by starting, uh, starting Taj Gibson? Well, what I like about Taj as, as compared to Nerlens is that offensively, Rick, he just gives you a little bit more. He's a more reliable option to just, you know, get around the boards and, and get some putbacks. You know, Nerlens Noel really doesn't have much hands. I like Taj's ability to set screens and move on the pick and roll and also pass. Uh, you know, Nerlens is really limited in terms of what he can give you on the offensive end. And when you combine that with the fact that uh, Alfred Payton was also starting it, sometimes you're going three on five on the offensive end. So I think Tibbs was looking to generate some more flow with the offense. You saw that unit closing in game two, and they were excellent. They were dynamic. Overall, we're missing Mitchell Robinson, who's our, our true big man on both ends of the floor. You know, his presence is definitely missed. But um, that I think that's what Tibbs was going for in terms of putting in Gibson and certain starting to um Derek Rose yeah. CP before we let you get on out of here you know just looking at ahead yeah. at the way this series has played out thus far for Julius Randle before the playoffs there was so much talk about Julius Randle who's next year uh, he's yeah. going to make about 19 million dollars or so that they would have to really look at signing him to a max deal the way he's played in this series thus far you know some people could say oh he's yeah. just a bad matchup I'm tending to lean towards the fact is this is who he is, and it's no disrespect what? to him. Yes, what? this is what he, who he is, and this is what he does. And at the end of the day, are you starting to feel, is there a just sense of belief yourself. with just the fans slap yourself right that now. perhaps this is not a max player, and this is what he is. He's a good piece, yeah. but he's not that centerpiece. I'm with you, Gerald. I think he is a good piece. He, he's not a 1A. I never thought he was a 1A, but he is a good piece. And it, I think it's just going to be a necessary evil for them to sign him to that deal because how, how do you gauge his trade value? What type of, of, you know, package do you bring back? Do you feel like it is comparable to the to the value that he brought to this team? He had an outstanding regular season, most improved player of the year, a career highs in points, rebounds, and assists, and he really made this team better. You know, there's no doubt he's a big reason why they were the four seed in the East, but um, they need a talent upgrade. And to me, they need a guy that – can carry this team over Julius Randle. They need a true 1A. Um, I'm still going to give him the money, Gerald. I, I think it's just a necessary... I, it, it's, just, it's just a necessary evil, man. I, I think he's earned it, and I, I think they're going to give it to him because you can't let him walk, and I don't think they're going to get uh, value in a trade that justifies trading him. I, I just think it's a tricky situation. Thank well, what you. About, well, what about... Wait a minute. And I guess, so Derek Rose yeah, is a yeah. free agent right now. He's making $7 mm -hmm. million. Dollars. Can you afford to let him go now? I mean, granted, the Knicks have about $50 million, if I'm not mistaken. They have yeah, cash money. space. They got money. But is it a wise investment to say you're going to pour a lot more money into Julius Randle? And what do you do with Derrick Rose? I would bring Rose back on a reasonable contract, Gerald. But the thing is, is that if you're going to let Julius walk, are you going to trade him? 
you're starting back from square one. And then and then what is the plan, right? What is the plan? And so that's why it's it's just a hard waters to navigate because if you trade him, are you going to trade him for, for more draft picks and then you're going back into the draft and rebuilding? There's no sure thing either way. I think ideally you sign him to the deal and you have four draft picks coming up in the 2021 draft. You see if you can package some of these up and, and maybe a young player to in your roster and see if you can bring in an, an all-star but potentially, you know, I don't know what Kawhi Leonard is going to do with the Clippers. I, I don't think he's going to come to the Knicks, but is he a possibility? Is a Dame Lillard trade a possibility? A CJ McCollum trade? You never know. But ideally, I think where they are right now, they have to continue to see if they can build Randall and, and see, see if they can improve the team that way. Yeah, it's it's uh, thanks, homeboy. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it remains to be seen. You know, RJ Barrett's going to be do some money in about another couple of yeah, years. Yeah. So That's you just got to figure. It. Yeah, I, I I understand that. Listen, CP, man, really thanks. really appreciate you <laughs> coming on the show, giving us the latest insight. Do us a favor. We got to do this again as this series yeah. progress. Yeah. As the Knicks and Hawks really have been some very very entertaining basketball. Enjoy yourself down there. Stay safe and look forward to talking to you real soon. Don't get the them lemon pepper wings. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald and Rick, I, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. Have a great weekend and, and great show as usual. I appreciate uh, you. CP, the franchise Knicks fan TV here on the Bottom Line Sports Show. Thank you very much.